Welcome to chapter four, my friends. In this chapter, we're looking at political economy. So let's go right ahead and define that right off the bat, okay? Our book defines political economy as the study of interaction between states and markets. So at the end of the day, we're looking at a relationship, okay? We're studying a relationship between the state and the markets within the state, okay? So now the, ma the two major components of all economies that we are going to care about are markets and property, okay? Now market is going to include the interactions between the forces of supply and demand that allocate resources. Okay. Now, property is going to include the goods or services that are owned by an individual or a group. Okay. So markets are arenas that uh, allow people to, to trade property and to exchange ownership. And then property is a socially defined relationship. Um, it's an institution that differentiates the rights of owners from the rights of non-owners, okay? So in other words, I'm allowed to do things with my sandwich that I am not allowed to do with your sandwich, okay? So these things are gonna go together. We're gonna examine these relationships as we go further in this chapter. Okay, so goods and services are gonna fall into two general types, depending on whether the product is excludable or uh, whether it's consumption or of the good reduces its availability. So let's start with private goods, okay? Private goods and public goods is what we're going to contrast and compare here. Um, but private goods are excludable, which means it is possible to prevent somebody else from eating your sandwich. Um, with private goods, consumption also reduces them, okay? So for example, if I eat my sandwich, there's less sandwich for you to eat. So markets are good at providing private goods. Why? Well, a consumer who wants the good has to pay something to make it. To get the good, he or she must be willing to pay enough to make it worth somebody else's time, to somebody else's effort to produce it. Okay. Now in contrast, public goods are non-excludable. Um, it is not possible to prevent someone else from seeing your lighthouse and thereby successfully navigating the land, okay? Um, in addition, consumer consumption does not reduce public goods, okay? If I see and benefit from a lighthouse, um, there is still the same amount of light left for the next uh, boat to come through and benefit from it, okay? So markets are not as good at producing public goods, and why? Well, a consumer who wants the good does not always have to pay for it. Uh, to get the good, he or she can simply free ride off of somebody else um, and benefit and purchase from that, okay? Uh, once someone builds a lighthouse, every boat that comes after it can use it to avoid crashing into the shore. Okay, so social expenditures. We talked a little bit about these in class. Let's go ahead and explore them a bit further here. Social expenditures are the state's provision of public benefits such as um, education, healthcare, transportation. Um, now, while the term welfare state has a very decidedly negative uh, connotation here in the United States, um, it has both positive and negative uh, economic impacts. Uh, for instance, um, while some forms of unemployment benefits may discourage people from uh, seeking work instead of relying on the government for their economic uh, support, government-funded job training programs or education may help individuals overcome some barriers to entering the workforce and may increase their individual wealth uh, over the long term. Likewise, um, an economy may not be able to function properly function without some for some form of government uh, funding, uh, some infrastructure investment, um, so road construction, um, internet access, uh, access to the energy grid, um, 
these are necessary for goods and services to travel. Uh, private companies and individuals often lack that the resources that are necessary to provide these things. And so we have to look at, to the public, to the government, to provide those things. Education and health also play a role in uh, economics as certain, indivi certain industries, um, such as the tech sector, um, can only operate once a population reaches a certain level of education training. Okay, so at the same time, rising welfare costs can pose a significant challenge to the long-term health of developed countries. So if we look at the uh, institutions and in action section in our chapter, uh, we see many Latin American countries have become innovators in, pu in providing public goods uh, to their citizens. Uh, social expenditure programs such as Mexico's Oportunidades or Brazil's Bolsa Familia uh, give cash transfers to poor families who keep their children in school, okay? So programs like these are good examples of how social expenditures are used by governments um, to address poverty, uh, to address inequality, and to build human capital, okay? So populations that are healthier, uh, populations that are more educated, um, they are um, going to start producing more in their labor force, okay? They're gonna be more productive. Uh, though this form of incentivized wealth redistribution does have its problems, okay? Uh, it has resulted in vast improvements, however, in human capital in many Latin American countries and has been tried in other parts of the world because of the success in Latin America. So the problem is going to come for all these social expenditures, how do we pay for them, okay? How do we pay for them? How do governments... How can they give out the, this, this money? Um, obviously, we all know the, the answer to this is taxes, that evil word, taxes. Taxes come from a variety of sources. We've got income taxes and corporate and payroll taxes and sales taxes and property taxes and sin taxes. The point is to be um, that... that um, not that government should not tax, okay? Not that it's not what we're looking at, but it is rather that the taxing is costly, okay? Uh, it costs the people. Ideally, states should only raise taxes when the value of the services they provide outweighs the harm done by taxes. And that's a balancing act that every state has to answer to for itself, okay? In the United States, it's gonna be different than how it is in Sweden, how it is in Nigeria, how it is in Iran. And that's how we're going to decide these social expenditures, should we give them, should we not? And that's what we're going to be exploring as we go forward. So like I said, countries face a significant challenge in trying to balance their market and taxation needs. Okay, higher taxes may increase government revenue, uh, which allows for more social expenditures in areas that can be good for the economy, such as uh, education and infrastructure spending. Uh, that, those, those, those are really good things. Taxation also can decrease a behavior uh, by either making a good or service more expensive or by decreasing its profitability. Uh, sin taxes penalize uh, behavior that is bad for, for society, okay? Uh, taxes on pollution, taxes on tobacco, on alcohol, um, we're seeing in, in Colorado and in uh, other states, um, marijuana usage, we're starting to see even in Illinois, they're talking about um, betting on sports and they're gonna tax on those kind of things, okay? So these taxes benefit the government and they are supposed to discourage people from doing them. Um, and so this is, um, the, a two-way street, and, and, and it's all supposedly making taxes look like a very good thing, okay? But on the other hand, we all know that taxes have a very negative impact, okay? Um, high corporate taxes, for example, may encourage businesses to move out of a state, out of a country. Um, payroll taxes, which are taxes on employers uh, based on the percentage they pay their staff, um, they, these can discourage businesses from hiring more people. And so by having that higher tax rate, we've actually killed um, the economy in, the, in those states or in those countries. And so like I said, there's this balancing act between uh, the social expenditures and the taxation rates. 
Okay, money is useful. Um, th that might be the most underrated thing that I've ever said, right? Uh, money is useful because people can use it to trade things. Without money, uh, we would have uh, have to barter for everything, which would be very inefficient. Um, with money, you can wait to buy things later, so you can store money. Uh, with money, you know how much wealth you have, so it's it's a unit of measurement, okay? Um, in the modern era, money has no intrinsic value of its own. Um, it, historically, it, um, money was tied to uh, to gold or to to uh, silver, things that had intrinsic value to these precious metals uh, that had like a, a hard value, okay? Economists generally agree that this is infeasible for the modern economies, okay? Uh, instead, the value of money largely rests now in the trust in that government, okay? Uh, the government who produces it and the trust in that others are gonna accept it as, as, the current, as currency, okay? At the very least, the government accepts its own money um, to pay for, for taxes. And so it has more value right there than like your monopoly money would have, okay? Um, in recent years, we've seen uh, the rise in online currencies that, which are not connected to a government, okay? Uh, Bitcoin, for example. Uh, they are neither produced by governments nor are they exchangeable for a hard good like, like gold or silver. And so it'll be interesting to see how these uh, work out moving forward in, in, uh, in, in our society. But regardless of the state, money is created by the state's treasury agencies. Uh, and then it is issued as currency to banks, uh, often through a central bank. Uh, these banks then lend and or distribute it to their customers. Okay? Those customers then exchange their money with each other, buying and selling the goods and services that they need, uh, helping to maintain a currency-based modern economy. So states have different ways to create money. In the United States and most other advanced economies, there's a central bank. In the United States, um, it's known as the Federal Reserve Board. Okay? And that effectively chooses how much money will be available for people to use. Banks also help control the amount of currency in the market by doing things such as setting interest rates, okay? A state central bank sets interest rates on their loans, which most private banks adopt for their own policy, okay? So when you have to pay more in, uh, when, when interest rates are high, uh, loans are more expensive to take out because you have to pay more uh, in order to take out that loan. But keeping money in a savings account yields you a better payoff. And so if they set the interest rate high, people are gonna stop spending, they're gonna start saving so that they can build that wealth, okay? Um, as a result, um, the, the, the central bank has some control over what is going on in the economy and whether money is circulating or whether money is kind of starting to, um, to be saved up in, in these banks, okay? Uh, in contrast, when the interest rates are very low, loans become cheap, and therefore savings are less rewarding, and as a result, spending increases, meaning that the amount of money running through our markets increases. Uh, this is one reason why lowering interest rates is considered an economic stimulus policy, it's because it gets people spending and stops people from saving as much. Now, if there's too much money circulating uh, at the same amount of uh, time, but there's the same amount of goods and services, so there's too much money and the same amount of goods and services, uh, what's going to happen is the value of the money is going to decline, okay? Uh, there will be more money to spend on the same number of goods, and so the prices of goods are going to go up. Uh, this is known as inflation. Uh, and hyperinflation also occurs when there is an extreme rise in the amount of money circulating. Uh, this can effectively undermine money as a source of value. Uh, at the peak of Zimbabwe's inflation in November of 2008, the prices were doubling nearly every 24 hours. Now think about that. If your milk is doubling in price every 24 hours, how do you keep up? Okay. Um, if there's not enough money circulating in the economy, it means that the value of the money increases, okay? Allowing people to buy more things with less money. Now that sounds like a wonderful thing, right? This is known as deflation. And while this sounds like a wonderful thing, uh, it reduces profits 
uh, from these transactions. And then when people or companies see less profits, they start laying people off, which means we're going to have rising unemployment. Uh, we're going to be cutting back on plans to expand their business. And so we feel further um, decreasing spending. Okay. So according to many economists, although some, some disagree, this was actually the major contributing factor to the uh, economic crisis that started in 2008, 2009. Okay. So all states regulate, um, exchanges in some way. Uh, in most countries, it is illegal to sell tainted food, uh, and FUMA has to be inspected. Some services and goods can be illegal, such as um, gambling, prostitution, drugs. Uh, other regulations govern how businesses operate. Okay, Democracies especially tend to make it illegal to employ workers in needlessly unsafe conditions. Um, also, to most um, democracies, are it's illegal to employ child labor. Okay, so Uzbekistan, for example, uh, has been criticized for enforce, for employing forced labor in its cotton production. Okay, an action that has sponsored international criticism and a movement towards regulations uh, preventing this. Uh, as for other regulations, a state may prevent firms from becoming monopolies or encourage state-regulated monopolies in areas of national interest. Uh, a monopoly, of course, is a situation in which there is only one firm uh, or, or seller uh, of a certain good. So in the United States, uh, most of our utilities are, are monopolies, such as electricity, such as water, uh, cable services. Um, our professional sports would be um, uh, monopolies, the NFL, uh, Major League Baseball, etc. Um, Amtrak rail service would be a monopoly. Okay, And so um, this is, these, are regulation, these are regulated by the government. Some major regulations that we want to talk about before we can move into some of the uh, some of the more in depth stuff is uh, tariffs, which are taxes on imported goods that are not applied to otherwise similar uh, domestic goods. Uh, so, like if um, a car was built in America, we don't have a tax on it. But then, if a car comes in from another country, there is a tax. That would be a tariff. Okay. So, a quota, which would be a limit on the number of certain uh, foreign goods that can enter the country. Maybe we're going to set this is how many can come in, and that's it. The rest you have to buy from American uh, made made sources or non-tariff regulatory barriers, um, health, packaging, uh, other restrictions that make it more difficult uh, for foreign goods to sell in our local markets. Um, these would be all some types of regulations, uh, and we want to know about these as we move forward into um, some, some policy-related activity. So there are advantages and disadvantages for having the state regulate trade. Uh, the regu advantages of regulation include um, we generate state revenue, okay? uh, we foster local industry, we protect local jobs, and we keep the wealth within the country. So those are all really good things, okay? but the advantages of free trade promote uh, competition, and competition often promotes um, higher quality and uh, lower prices. Uh, it keeps the cost of goods low, and it stimulates domestic innovation in areas of comparative advantage. And therefore, um, we are able to get better and better products rather than kind of settling for the status quo. Okay, so there are four uh, competing views on uh, political e economies. So let's just list them first, and then we're going to dive into each one uh, separately. So the first one is going to be liberalism, and then social democracy, communism, and mercantilism. So the main element of liberalism includes uh, laissez-faire capitalism, which basically means hands off to the government. Okay, uh, so we have minimal state in intervention to support the free market. Now, liberalism values the protection of private property. It enforces contracts and it breaks up monopolies. So, according to the liberal view, unemployment and inequality are regrettable. Uh, they're, they're not fans of them, but these are normal and they are inevitable, okay? Attempts by the state to correct these uh, will simply have the consequences of making everybody worse off instead of just these poor people who, uh, who are uh, disadvantaged at the time. Uh, so since liberalism advocates limiting state power, uh, it is often associated with liberal, liberal democracies, um, United States, uh, United Kingdom. However, countries such as uh, Singapore, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, they show that it is possible for a country to provide economic freedom, but still 
uh, sometimes very severely even, uh, restrict political rights. The next viewpoint we want to look at is social democracy. Now, the goal of social democracy is to balance freedom and equality. Okay? And so the state plays an active role in shaping markets. So unlike the hands-off approach of liberalism, uh, here the state is going to provide uh, strong protection for private property. Uh, there is free trade, but state-supported industries. Okay? And there is a significant redistribution of wealth via taxes. Okay, uh, public investment is going to be strong in education and in transportation and um, health care. Uh, and generally, there's going to be a, a strong safety net for the poor. Uh, social democratic systems include a large redistribution of wealth. Uh, so we have high taxes and we're going to then on the backside have high social expenditures. Okay, but also strong protections to guarantee the functioning of free markets, including private ownership, um, contract protections, things along those lines. So like economic liberals, uh, social democrats do favor uh, free trade, but they seek to balance um, a potential loss of jobs by supporting key industries, uh, providing social safety nets for their workers. Uh, France, for instance, uh, owns 15% of Air France. So social democracy is the typical um, political system of Scandinavian countries in Europe, uh, and, and many countries in Northern Europe. The goal of communism is to eliminate individual economic freedom to achieve equality, okay? So they want to achieve equality. Uh, in communism, there's a high level of state intervention. Uh, there is nationalized industry under heavy bureaucratic control. Uh, prices and wages are set by the state, and individuals have very limited choices of what jobs they can get. Uh, there is little or no uh, private property. Uh, there is a massive redistribution of wealth, and trade is highly regulated. Okay, so this one's a little different than, a lot different from liberalism, um, and, and significantly different from social democracy as well. So while communism was a major economic system during the 20th century, a uh, few states are truly communist today. Uh, Eastern Europe has largely transitioned to liberalism or at least mixed economies in countries such as China, uh, Russia. Uh, they pursue policies that are closer to mercantilism now. Uh, even Cuba, which was a long-standing communist uh, um, front, has uh, recently instituted so, some market reforms. Uh, so North Korea may be the, uh, they're not the ideal case maybe, but it's probably closer to the communist model than any other country today. Uh, but even the, uh, the, the hermit kingdom uh, is slowly adapting to some free market elements uh, if just to alleviate some of the, um, the supply shortages uh, for, the, uh, for the elite in, in, in that country. Our final viewpoint is mercantilism. And the goal of mercantilism is to maximize state wealth to increase state power. Okay? There's an active role for the state in mercantilism. Taxes and subsidies support key industries, and there are um, nationalized industries and peristyles, and the, the foreign influence is limited via tariffs, via trade barriers, uh, limits on investment, uh, those things, those regulations that we talked about before uh, we're talking about these viewpoints. Uh, mercantilism involves close cooperation between the state and the firms, um, especially large firms that export. Okay? It is based on the belief that exports are good, imports are bad. Okay? As a result, the state firms, the state funds firms uh, that ex export and places restrictions on what consumers can purchase from abroad. Uh, Japan and South Korea are often given as typical examples of mercantilist economies. Uh, and many experts are starting to argue that China's pro-market reforms have moved the country towards uh, mercantilism rather than liberal uh, economic systems. So let's go ahead and shift gears just a little bit and look at for ways to compare systems, uh, countries, and let's start with GDP. GDP is the gross domestic product. Uh, and it is a common economic measure used to compare the size of the economy of different countries. But there may be some limits to its comparability. Okay? For instance, it is cheaper to live in India than it is in the United States. So the same salary can go a lot further. Uh, therefore, GDP adjusted for purchasing power, GDP, PPP, can be translated to how much stuff can the average person buy in a year. 
okay? So also, uh, because more populated countries naturally produce larger markets, um, as more people need to purchase more goods, uh, we might also try to control for the size of the population. Uh, so we might d divide the GDP by the number of people in the country and get a per capita GDP, okay? And so GDP is one way that we're going to be able to compare uh, countries and their economies. So a question that we might want to ask is, is it more useful to compare economies on their overall growth and wealth, or is, it, is equality um, and the reduction of poverty a more important goal? And so wealth and economic equality are actually more linked than some people may think. Uh, economic growth and development may be uh, more achievable if a lot of citizens have the ability to innovate and create wealth. Um, at the very worst, poverty prevents people from being able to achieve their potential, okay? And so large, persistent inequality can also be a sign that a society is chronically failing uh, to reap the gains from human development. And so the Gini coefficient, which is not an acronym, by the way, uh, it's named after an Italian statistician, statistician um, the Gini coefficient is a measure of unequal distribution. So a high number on the Gini index um, is going to be indicative of a country that is highly unequal, and a low number is indicative of a greater equality. So now it's what are we, what are we valuing? Are we at valuing um, the size of the economy or the equality within that economy? And so now we're looking at different ways to compare countries. Still another way that we can measure uh, these things is outside of wealth and um, the, is the quality of life of the people living in a country. The, um, the Human Development Index, the, um, the HDI, is compiled through the United Nations and takes into account a country's um, expected years of education, uh, their life expectancy, their income per capita, and puts together an index, the HDI. And still another version of um, um, way to measure is through happiness. Um, while it may seem like a strange measure of economic performance, the pursuit of happiness is one of the central motivations driving the human behavior. Okay, And so therefore, it makes sense to compare countries on how happy their citizens are. Uh, wealthier countries tend to have a happier populations. This isn't, this isn't always the, the perfect fit here. Um, Costa Ricans uh, score just as highly as Americans um, and Eastern Europeans uh, in particular, are less happy than countries at a comparative level or even uh, lower uh, in development. So with the decline of communism during the 1980s and 90s, uh, liberalism seemed to emerge as a dominant economic model uh, in much of the world. Uh, many countries actively sought to reform their economies, instituting policies that cut taxes, uh, re reduced regulations, uh, privatized state-owned businesses and public goods, and expanded private property rights. However, um, we should be hesitant about declaring this, this is the century of liberalism, okay? Most industrialized democracies still adhere to a social democratic ideology. Even the United States, the poster child of liberalism, uh, may hide a large welfare state in a complicated array of taxes uh, and tax breaks. Um, second, the peak of liberalization seems to have occurred around 2005, um, and so we've had little change and even some backsliding since then. Uh, finally, uh, we have seen a growing resistance to liberalism, especially in richer countries. Uh, increased trade may raise overall wealth, uh, but many people employed in traditional manufacturing jobs have seen their jobs disappear. Uh, now most of these jobs have been lost to uh, technological innovation, uh, not outsourcing. But in a classic example of uh, correlation does not equal causation, uh, many people still blame globalization. Um, so th this has led to... Um, uh, rising support for, for far-right and populist parties in countries in Europe and the United States. Um, this trend may partly explain uh, such things as the passing of Brexit uh, in the United Kingdom um, and support for Donald Trump even here in the United States in the presidential elections. Okay, so uh, like always, let's go ahead and recap this video. Let's take a look at what we looked at in this lecture. Uh, first, we looked at the basics of market economies. Um, the second, we looked at um, how states use a number of policies to shape economies. 
Uh, next, when it comes to political economic systems, uh, states vary between liberalism, social democracy, communism, mercantilism. Uh, next, there are many ways that we can measure wealth and prosperity, and so we want to take that into um, to, um, consideration when we're looking at and comparing these countries. And finally, liberalism continues to have its supporters, but it is having uh, several detractors as well. So friends, that's chapter four, political economies. Uh, lots of stuff to dig your teeth into here. Uh, lots of discussions to have. Um, but remember that test is coming May 24th. And so we're going to be ready for that because it's us versus the test. Now make sure that you're looking around at the people in the class. Are they on track? Are you on track? With all of us together, okay? So make sure you're taking care of each other. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. And we will see you in class uh, tomorrow. Have a great day.